Penetics versus cladistics. In the last class, we have seen that the diversity on the planet Earth, staggering diversity, the most important characteristic, right? The most, you know, uh, yeah, most interesting, you can say, characteristic of the life on Earth or the planet Earth is its life. And this biodiversity uh, is not really unrelated or randomly arranged organism. These are all interconnected. So that is that that particular essence is what the cladistics is all about. Phenetics is mostly based on the morphology, you know. So one simple example is that in this class of the students, you can say, okay, the two persons, either a boy or a girl or two girls or a two boy, look similar. So does that mean that they are really related, you know? So they might be looks very similar, but they might be completely unrelated, right? So that is the reason why trusting so much on the morphology is not so good but usually uh, people who look really similar are kind of relative right like siblings usually siblings look very similar especially homozygotic twins you know looks very similar isn't it so at, to a certain level you can trust the gross morphology but uh, the you know too much of the trust is kind of uh, you know tricky you should not do so that is why the, we have got cladistics in it so phenetics is the traditional taxonomy which is based on morphological traits to classify organisms while cladistics is not all uh, characters we use in cladistics only shared derived characters that is synapomorphic character which we introduced in earlier class as well so cladistics is based on the real evolutionary relationship between the, the living organism not just by look alike it's only the shared character, the homologous characters that we use for cladistics, you know. So that is why the phenetic system is all gone. It, it has become obsolete. Now we have cladistic or phylogenetic rather phylogenetic systematics, you know. So evolution, as you know, evolution is the descent with modification or, uh, you know, uh, populations increase in the frequency of traits that are suited to the environment, you know. So allele frequency, change in allele frequency in a population over time, over generation is another definition of the evolution, especially molecular evolution or microevolution, right? So yes, so that is the evolution. So evolution is really important. Evolution is the reason why we have this staggering diversity of life on planet Earth. And these are all interrelated, interrelated, you know. So that spirit, we should always look at the diversity with that spirit. So whenever you see this kind of organisms on planet Earth, think of a giant tree, the tree of life. All these are interrelated by the tree of life. The concept is first introduced by the Darwin, you know. So the difference here is that both are biological classification and both use similar features to group organisms. But the traditional taxonomy or phenetics use mostly similar features to group organisms into hierarchical level called taxonomic group. And these features are usually morphology, not really uh, you know, uh, they don't actually differentiate between, uh, you know, this synapomorphy and simpliciomorphy, ancestral and derived characters, you know, just like gross morphology. But cladistics use certain shared character, that is shared derived characters to group organisms by common ancestry, better for determining the relationship, you know, not just by the gross morphology and simply classifying, you know, but common ancestry, you know. Like in linguistics, for example, classifying words based on its etymology, the word history, you know, that is that is also a cladistic way, you know. Simple example of this phonetic clustering is when you go to a library, you will see that based on gender, uh, you know, the, the, the titles, the book titles are arranged. That is just by the gross. So we are, they don't look at the ancestry of how the books are being evolved, right? So that is the difference between the traditional taxonomy and modern systematics, you know. So if you look these two together, you will see that uh, which two looks quite similar. So that is how we are actually classifying. So you might say that, okay, this is, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a reptile, isn't it? Uh, the, uh, you know, the, the caiman or, uh, you know, the uh, uh, crocodile, isn't it? Oh, yes, so it is a it could, it could be a crocodile and uh, a dinosaur are quite similar in look, so it should be similar. While uh, the apes are very different, it is a flying creature, isn't it? So that way, uh, you know, the phonetic clustering 
or uh, traditional systematics, traditional taxonomy, classify these two into the same group, reptilia, while the birds are different, birds are aves. But as per the modern systematics, which is based on the DNA sequence and protein sequences, we have now a lot of evidence that this, this and the, the parrot, for example, uh, the birds and reptiles together form one clade, which is not shared with the early splitting reptiles. You know, so this is what you call it as a ropsid, right? So, yeah, so birds are also one kind of a dinosaur, you can say you know, flying dinosaurs, right? So, uh, yes, so that reptile as such, removing the aves is, you know, paraphyletic. It is not accepted anymore in the modern systematics, you know. But early on, we used to have reptiles, reptilia and aves separate, you know. So, all these things are interrelated. So, this is how the tree of life concept started. So, this is from his own, Darwin's own notebook, you know. I think diagram, it's a very famous diagram from the notebook of Charles Darwin, uh, which I came, the original of this was kept in Natural History Museum in London when I went there in 19, uh, you know, not 19, 2009, you know. So as you can see here, it's on his own handwriting. It says that I think case must be that one generation should have as many living as now. So it's basically what he's trying to say is that A is, uh, you know, a lot more further than B and C. So B and C are a lot more interrelated than either with the D or either with A. So it's all about the, it's like the real tree, the branch, how these branches are quite connected with each other. The tree of life, different branches. Some branches are coming from the same but, you know, some clades are coming from the same branch. So all these are having the shared ancestry. So that is what. So in, in this kind of tree-like illustration, tips of these trees represent the current biodiversity. That is basically extant species. While branch points represent the speciation. So these are all speciation. And the root represents the origin of life on earth. A biogenesis. So something that happened only once in the history of life or a couple of times during that time only you know so why this doesn't happen now because the environment is no more conducive even if the biogenesis happened then it can quickly be eaten by you know bacteria and other uh, heterotrophs and uh, you know uh, other uh, organisms that can decompose isn't it and also for a biogenesis you need a set of uh, environmental requirement you know for example uh, anoxic environment but right now we have all oxic except in few places you know deep uh, in the in, uh, in in deep mine for example is anoxic isn't it so yes yeah, so anoxic environment and high energy environment right so all those things are and a reducing atmosphere are requirement for abiogenism also of very high heat so these right now we don't have it so that is why the, this doesn't happen right now and uh, evolution, of course, we will take up this course, complete course on evolution. But in summary, there are three kinds of evolution or rather two kinds. So divergent and convergent. So, of course, there is parallel evolution also, which is kind of a convergent. So divergent means accumulation of differences between groups which lead to formation of new species. The true form, form of evolution is divergent. While convergent is spurious, you know, it, it is not real, but it's because that uh, because of the mistake that we we do because how we interpret these two organisms are related right conversion means acquisition of the same biological trait in unrelated lineage completely unrelated for example uh, butterfly wings and uh, you know uh, the bird wings and bat wings right uh, and we call it as wing and we group all these organisms together that is wrong isn't it so it's a convergent evolution now, parallel evolution means development of similar trait in related but distinct species descending from the same ancestor but from different clades. So that is called the parallel evolution, right? It's a, it's a mix of diversion and conversion together, you know. So parallel means development of a trait in distinct species that are not closely related. Of course, they are still related, but it's kind of not really close. 
but share similar original trade and respond to similar evolutionary pressure. So that is what parallel. Again, that is kind of a hazy concept, but divergent and convergent are really clear. You know, so convergent means independent evolution of similar features in species that are different periods or epochs in time. You know, so convergent is, uh, you know, it is going to be a problem in phylogeny if you also include the convergent traits that is homoplastic sequence is one, you know, so that we will see it. So divergent means A becomes S while A becomes T is completely divergent because the species split. While parallel means related, A becomes S and A becomes S, you see. Now, convergent means completely unrelated, evolve similar features in response to the same environmental characteristics. A becomes S, T became S, you see. So, that is what, like, uh, you know, insect and aves developing but the wings. Though the wings, you know, only for locomotion it is fine to fly. But if you look deep in it, there is no similarity. You know, insects' appendages are very different from uh, the wings of the bats or wings of the birds, isn't it? So this is the conversion evolution in a succulent plant genera, Euphorbia and Astrophytum. See, the Astrophytum and Euphorbia are quite unrelated, but still, uh, you know, they, they have uh, quite similar in the body form radiantly symmetrical right and both are succulent means that these are in an arid environment and in response to the same environmental pressure this kind of characteristics are these unrelated lineages evolved that is called convergent evolution you know analogous traits and homoplastic sequences all these things so divergent evolution leads to homologous structure divergent means a real evolution you know uh, one lineage splitting into two, one species uh, changing into two or uh, more species, speciation event, right? Origin of species. Remember the book by the Darwin, isn't it? So traits that are morphologically and functionally similar due to shared ancestry in biology, a relationship is only and only because of the shared ancestry, you know? And if you say that, uh, yes, yeah, so relationship because of the similar in looks, that is the morphology, that is not really a relationship in uh, in biology, you know. So homologous structures or divergent evolution is the natural real evolution. Uh, you know, homologous structures could be plesiomorphic or apomorphic. So plesiomorphy means basically uh, present in the MRCA, that is most recent common ancestor, but lost in some of the descendants. Plesiomorphic, right? So that is basically ancestral characters, not derived, ancestral. One example is poikilothermy, for, that is cold-bloodedness for ectothermy for most recent common ancestor of reptiles and birds. So the birds and reptiles, the, the ancestor wa had this character, poikilothermy, cold-blooded. So basically cold-blooded means that they cannot change its uh, body temperature in response to a new environment. Uh, you know, so basically you cannot maintain uh, the uniform uh, you know, the internal temperature, uh, for example, uh, human beings around 36.6 degrees, immaterial, you are living in um, polar regions or in Antarctic mission. When I was in Antarctica, my temperature was still same, you know. Uh, yes, yeah, so homeothermy, that is called, technically it's called homeothermy, right, warm, warm blooded creatures. But cold blooded creatures, uh, they keep on changing the temperature in response to environment. For example, a snake, when they are in a cave, the body temperature is low. When they are in, on the arid region desert, then the temperature is high, isn't it? Yes, yeah, so uh, the ancestor of these uh, reptiles and birds had poikilothermy, but then the descendant, one of the descendant is birds, which they lost it. You know, so it is basically homeothermic, right? The warm blooded, isn't it? So such characters, are known as plesiomorphic character while apomorphy means present in MRC and all its descendants for example mammary gland is a shared derived feature of the entire mammals without a single exception female uh, females of every mammals have got mammary gland and that is the reason why we define it as a mammalia which is a natural group monophyletic group you know Convergent evolution lead to analogous structure. So this convergent evolution is not natural. It is artificial and it's because of the mistake, 
you know how we interpret we think that okay they are evolved together but it's not all right it doesn't exist in nature so traits are morphological and functionally similar even though there is no common ancestor you know so also known as homoplasy from the greek same form right so this is the summary of different types traits character states clades and sequence of the evolution so type there are two mainly main types divergent and convergent of course there is parallel but uh, you know it's it's quite hazy the definition and there are a lot of confusion exist divergent evolution lead to homologous structures while convergent evolution lead to analogous structures so these are traits morphological characteristics right now homologous traits can have synapomorphic character state or simplicyomorphic character state so plesiomorphy and apomorphy are different right uh, apomorphy means shared derived character while plesiomorphy means ancestral characters so either of these characters shared by uh, descendants right then it's called sin that prefix is being used synapomorphy means everybody has got that derived character state so that leads to monophyletic clade the group you know so one clade is a group of organism that have the same common ancestor while simplesiomorphy leads to paraphyletic groups so in strict sense paraphyletic group you cannot call it as a clade because the, the term clade is reserved only for monophyletic groups the one which you can cut with just one cut but uh, groups like reptiles in order to cut from the tree of life you need minimum two cuts because inside reptile a is there, that also you need to cut off isn't it so that is called paraphyletic group right it's not a clade per se and homoplasy leads to polyphyletic groups uh, completely unrelated like you know if you group together if you make a new system of classification you group together butterflies birds and bats together because all they have got wings it is paraphyletic it's completely nonsense kind of uh, you know uh, classification and yes yeah, so homo homologous uh, you know sequences can be either orthologous or paralogous so uh, orthologous sequences are sequences separated by speciation events while paralogous are the sequences separated by gene duplication events uh, you know alpha and beta chains of hemoglobin classic example of paralogous sequences while orthologous sequences are uh, human heme and uh, uh, cat heme you know uh, different hemes the protein uh, which are actually separated because of the speciation events right so that is called orthologous well paralogous means gene duplication as we will see more in the uh, evolution paralogous sequences are uh, you know one of the stepping stones for the, the evolution of new genes so the new genes are being evolved because of the paralogous evolution so paralogy happens gene duplication happens and the new gene acquires new function you know so that is how the the new new genes are being formed so modern taxonomy is uh, the the basis of the modern taxonomy is comparative anatomy because we look for the homologous structures not analogous structures we need a deep homology you know shared derived characters that is synapomorphic characters we also do comparative embryology that is similar embryo development that is also the ontogeny right uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny the heckel's uh, recapitulation theory you might remember so the ontogeny is also very important right ontogeny not ontology ontology is a philosophical concept ontogeny is a developmental or embryological concept right so embryology also plays a crucial role especially for sexually reproducing organisms taxonomy you know and also the molecular systematics similarity in dna rna amino acid sequences of the proteins so comparative uh, anatomy and embryology and uh, yes for the comparative anatomy we look for homologous and we distinguish between analogous structure and we don't rely on the analogous structures for example the four limbs of all these uh, you know vertebrates right bonds uh, of four limbs right shows uh, similarities in the mammals right so this is because of the adaptive radiation that we will see that splitting of uh, completely different morphological forms in a very short period of time you know the evolution of various uh, subforms 
because of the changing environment that is the adaptive radiation you know all adaptations to various environmental niches right so yes this is uh, homologous structures right so adaptive radiation means the evolution of ecological and phenotypic diversity within a rapidly multiplying lineage right so within mammals one single species that is called isostrodon lived around 23 crore year, years ago have evolved staggering diversity of various mammals with great ecological diversity like dwarf in the sea bat in the sky and phenotypic diversity like four limbs that's one example of the adaptive radiation you know while this one is a convergent evolution right the the uh, you know the uh, uh, what do you call the uh, uh, yes so the wings isn't it wings of bats technically it is a forelimb of a tetrapod vertebrate you know it is a mammal you know while wings of uh, uh, the birds or uh, the reptile which is quite similar isn't it reptile and bird but if you also include the wings of bat uh, wings of the butterfly it is again this convergent evolution isn't it so that is what homology you see that it's all different different species and homology is basically the structure because of the uh, you know the uh, divergent evolution while analogous traits the birds the wings of bird and a fly wing the mosquito it's because of the analogy analogous uh, traits because of the convergent evolution right and embryology as i told you embryology is also very important characteristic for the taxonomy you know taxonomic character not just morphology but also embryology how the the organisms develop the concept of evo devo is evolutionary biology and developmental biology are quite related and in many universities they teach evo evolutionary biology and developmental biology together to emphasize to highlight this uh, you know this immense similarity the recapitulation theory is uh, also known as embryological parallelism is a hypothesis that the developing uh, you know embryo to the adult animals go through stages resembling or representing the successive stages in the evolution of their uh, remote ancestors ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny by heckel right so it's the reason the real reason is that uh, you know uh, the genes which are involved in embryological development especially early stage are deeply conserved one example would be hox gene you know so hox gene is expressed early on in human embryo embryological development and this hox gene is shared between entire metazoans where whenever this bilateral symmetry originated so that time that common ancestor most recent common ancestor had hox gene and we still have it you know so that is the reason why uh, the developmental pattern and phylogeny are quite similar so the cladogram is basically a diagram that shows how organisms are related based on shared derived characters that is synapomorphic characters uh, such as feather hair or scale for the animals right so yes so we are looking at the shared derived character that those are represented in a phylogram or a cladogram in tick marks you know for example this is a clade salamander turtle and wolf four leg locomotion is uh, the shared derived character for the entire clade so the the ancestor of this clade had four legged locomotion you know tiktalic isn't it that is the the fossil evidence we have and do you know what this clade is this is tetrapoda right tetrapod vertebrates isn't it so this including grouper there is jaw bones or shark right including lamprey vertical vertebral column so it's vertebrate isn't it so yes yeah, so that is the cladogram so this is a cladogram of uh, uh, close relatives of the human being chimpanzee rhesus monkey spider monkey and ring tail lemur so you can see that these are some of the the tick mark represent the synapomorphic characters and this is the synapomorphic character is what we use it for classifying plants and animals uh, in taxonomy we usually use something called dichotomous scheme you know to identify the organism so it is something like a table with two options if option a go to a number option b go to another number so these are characteristic given in the pairs so read both the characteristic and either go to another set of characteristics or terminal that is identify the organism based on uh, you know uh, 
this character for example is it a pollen pollen grain is a, a, a how many kolpa are there in the, in the pollen the groups is it two kolpa bicolpate or tricolpate you know so based on that you go to the tricolpate and then identify the angiosperm you know so yeah so early on in the dichotomous scheme these are the shared derived character which is deeply conserved and later on it becomes less conserved you know so that way you can identify for example this is the the key for the monostromatic green algae early on as you can see these are really conserved fronts are macroscopic tubular or fronts are macroscopic blade like so is it monostromatic in cross section or is it a tube like a uh, one cell thick in the cross section you know is it tube or is it a blade so if it is tube go to number two bladenia or number three like that you know you can actually identify uh, this based on this dichotomous king so dichotomy the two and why dichotomy not trichotomy because in every uh, thing it has got only two options you know you can either go here or there so it's a it's a classic way to identify a species by looking at the dichotomous key you know so if you have this key you can you can try to identify an unknown species by looking at the deeply conserved characters you know so plants and fungi if you look the deeply conserved character is that seed formation isn't it form the seed then of course it has to be plants while there is no seed of course spermatophytes only right forms the seed and there is no seed then uh, with the true roots stems and leaves then you can actually go towards uh, the algae or moss or you know the ferns right with true roots stems and leaves it is a fern then of course uh, you know the, it forms the seed then no flower or flower so you know if there is no flower then it's a corn bearing plant isn't it gymnosperm and if there are flowers and just angiosperm then again you can uh, look at that based on other set of the dichotomous identification key and all these dichotomous identification keys are now uh, you know integrated into the algorithms of the plant identifying apps like uh, plant snap or uh, you know flower it so you know that is that is how these plants i mean these apps work by integrating this dichotomous identification key into the algorithms of that apps 